The Bishop's Apron, a novel by Somerset Maugham, Part One. One. The world takes people very willingly at the estimate in which they hold themselves. With a fashionable bias for expression in a foreign tongue, it calls modesty mauvaise haunt, and the impudent are thought merely to have a proper opinion of their merit. But Ponsonby was really an imposing personage. His movements were measured and noiseless, and he wore the sombre garb of a gentleman's butler with impressive dignity. He was a large man, flabby and corpulent, with a loose, smooth skin. His face, undisturbed by the rapid play of expression, which he would have thought indecorous, had a look of placid respectability. His eyes, with their puffy lower lids, rested on surrounding objects heavily, and his earnest, obsequious voice gave an impression of such overwhelming piety that your glance, involuntarily, fell to his rotund calves for the gaiters episcopal. He looked gravely at the table set out for luncheon, while Alfred, the footman, walked round it, placing bread in each napkin. "'Is Tommy Tiddler coming today, Mr. Ponsonby?' he asked. "'His lordship is expected,' returned the butler, with a frigid stare. He emphasised the aspirate to mark his disapproval of the flippancy, wherewith his colleague referred to a person who was not only the brother of his master, but a member of the aristocracy. "'Here he is,' said Alfred, unabashed, looking out of the window. "'He's just drove up in a cab.' Lord Spratter walked up the steps and rang the bell. Though Ponsonby had seen him two or three times a week for ten years, he gave no sign of recognition. "'Am I expected to luncheon today, Ponsonby?' "'Yes, my lord.' Lord Spratter was middle-aged, of fresh complexion notwithstanding his grey hair, and his manner was quick and breezy. He carried his years and the increasing girth which accompanied them with a graceful light-heartedness, and was apt to flatter himself that with the light behind he might still pass for five-and-thirty. He had neither the wish nor the intention to grow old. But the man of fifty, seeking to make the most of himself, must use many careful adjustments. Not for him are the loose, ill-fitting clothes that become a stripling of eighteen. His tailor needs a world of skill to counteract the slackening of muscle and to minimise the excess of avoir du poids. On his toilet table are numerous pots and jars and bottles, and each is a device to persuade himself that the troublesome years are not marching on. He takes more care of his hands than a professional beauty. Above all, his hair is a source of anxiety. Lord Spratter, by many experiments, had learnt exactly how to dress it so that no unbecoming boldness was displayed, but he never seized a brush and comb without thinking, like Achilles, stalking melancholy through the fields of death, that he would much sooner be a crossing-sweeper of fifteen than a peer of the realm at fifty. "'Do you insist on leading me upstairs like a ewe-lamb, Ponsonby?' he asked. The butler's face outlined the merest shadow of a smile as silently he preceded Lord Spratter to the drawing-room, for nothing in the world would he have omitted the customary ceremonies of polite society. "'Lord Spratter,' he announced. The guest advanced and saw his sister Sophia, his brother Theodore, his nephew and his niece. Lady Sophia, a handsome and self-assured woman of five and fifty, the eldest of the family, put aside her book and rose to kiss him. Canon Spratter extended two fingers. Good heavens, have you invited me to a family party? than which, I venture to think, there can be nothing more charming, nothing more beautiful, and nothing more entertaining," replied the canon gaily. "'Theodore is cultivating domesticity,' retorted the peer, with a look at his younger brother. "'I believe he wants to be made a bishop.' "'You take nothing seriously, Thomas. It is a failing of which I cannot but recommend you to correct yourself.' "'Stow it, Theodore,' replied the other, unmoved. Theodore Spratter, vicar of St. Gregory's, South Kensington, and canon of Turkenbury, was the youngest son of the first Earl Spratter, Lord Chancellor of England. He was a handsome man, 
tall and erect, and his presence was commanding. His comely looks had been to him through life a source of abiding pleasure. He preserved the slenderness, the brisk carriage of youth. And though but little younger than his brother, his fair hair, turning now to grey, remained profuse and curling. His fine blue eyes looked out upon the world with a happy self-confidence, and his mobile, shapely mouth was ever ready to break into a smile. The heartiness of his laughter sufficed to make all and sundry his particular friends. It was pleasant to meet a man who was so clean and fresh, always so admirably dressed, and whose appearance was so prepossessing. But he was nowhere more imposing than in the pulpit, for he wore his cassock and surplice, his scarlet hood, with a reassuring dash which convinced you that here was a pilot in whom you need not hesitate to set your trust. He had a certain gift for oratory. His voice was resonant and well modulated. The charm of his active personality was such that though, in those flowing periods and that wealth of metaphor, amid these sounding forcible adjectives, the matter of his discourse often escaped you, you felt notwithstanding exhilarated and content. If his sermons redounded to his own honour rather than to the honour of God, it was not Canon Spratter who suffered. When he was left a widower with two young children, his sister Sophia, who had remained unmarried, came to live with him. In course of time, Lionel, his son, grew up, entered the church, and became his curate. His daughter Winnie was twenty-one, and in her fragile, delicate way, as pretty as a shepherdess of Dresden, China. She had all the charm of innocence, and such knowledge of the world as three seasons in London, and the daily example of her father could give her. By the way, Lionel, I suppose you took that wedding at 2.30 yesterday? Yes, answered the curate. But the curtness of his reply was almost injurious, contrasted with his father's florid delivery. It seemed barely decent to treat in monosyllables with the vicar of St. Gregory's. His lightest observations were coloured by that rich baritone, so that they gained a power and a significance which other men, less happily gifted, have only in treating of grave affairs. I often wonder it's worth your while to marry quite poor people, suggested Lord Spratter. Why don't you send them down to the East End? Our duty, my dear Thomas, we have to do our duty, replied Canon Spratter. Ponsonby, entering the room to intimate that luncheon was ready, looked significantly at Lady Sophia without speaking and silently withdrew. I see that the Bishop of Barchester is dangerously ill, said Lionel when they were seated. Lionel was as tall and fair as his father, but lacked his energy and his force of character. He was dressed as little like a clergyman as possible. I'm told he's dying, answered the canon gravely. He's been out of health for a long time, and I cannot help thinking that when the end comes, it will be a happy release. I met him once and thought him a very brilliant man, remarked Lady Sophia. Andover, cried the canon with surprise, throwing himself back in his chair. My dear Sophia, I know he had a certain reputation for learning, but I never had any great opinion of it. Lady Sophia, for all reply, pursed her lips. She exchanged a glance with Lord Spratter. Of course I am the last person to say anything against a man who stands on the threshold of eternity, added the canon. But between ourselves, if the truth must be told, he was nothing more than a doddering old idiot, and a man of no family. Than this, in Theodore Spratter's judgment, nothing could be said more utterly disparaging. I wonder who'll succeed him, said Lionel thoughtfully. I really don't know who there is with any great claim upon the government. He met his brother's bantering smile, and quick to catch its meaning, answered without hesitation. To tell you the truth, Thomas, I shouldn't be at all surprised if Lord Stonehenge offered the bishopric to me. You'd look rather a toff in leggings, observed the other. Wouldn't he, Sophia? Lady Sophia gave the canon an inquiring stare. My dear Tommy, I've not seen his legs for forty years. I think this is hardly a matter upon which you should exercise your humour, my dear, 
retorted the canon, with a twinkle in his eye. Well, I hope you will accept no bishopric until you've made quite sure that the golf links are beyond reproach, said Lord Spratt. I'll tell Lord Stonehenge that an eighteen-hole course is a sin qua non of my elevation to the episcopacy, retorted the canon, ironically. Between Lord Spratt and his sister on the one hand and Theodore on the other was an unceasing duel in which the parson fought for the respect due to his place and dignity, while the others were determined to suffer no nonsense. They attacked his pretension with flouting and battered his pomposity with ridicule. To anything in the nature of Rodomontade, they were merciless, and in their presence he found it needful to observe a certain measure. He knew that no society was august enough to abash them into silence, and so took care not to expose himself under very public circumstances to the irony of the one or to the brutal mocking of the other. But the struggle was not altogether unpleasant. He could hit back with a good deal of vigour and never hesitated to make plain statements in plain language. His position gave him the advantage that he could marshal on his side the forces of morality and religion and when they had dealt so good a blow that he could not conceal his discomfiture, he was able to regain his self-esteem by calling them blasphemous or vulgar. The canon turned to his daughter with an affectionate smile. And what have you been doing this morning, Winnie? I went to see the model dwellings that Mr. Railing is interested in. By Jove, you're not going in for district visiting, Winnie? cried her uncle, putting up his eyeglass. I hope you won't catch anything. Winnie blushed a little under his stare. The condition of the poor is awfully bad. I think one ought to do something. Who is Mr. Railing? inquired Lionel. One of the Worcestershire railings. No, just a common or garden railing, said the canon. He rubbed his hands and looked round the table for appreciation of this mild jest, but only his curate was civil enough to smile. He's a mighty clever young man, and I think he'll be very useful to me, he added. I notice that your actions are always governed by unselfish motives, murmured Lady Sophia. God helps those who help themselves. Mr. Railing is a Christian socialist and writes for the radical papers. I think he has a future, and I feel it my duty to give him some encouragement. His voice assumed those rolling, grandiloquent tones which rang so effectively in St. Gregory's Church. Nowadays, when socialism is rapidly becoming a power in the land, when it is spreading branches into every stratum of society, it behoves us to rally it to the Church. Christianity is socialism. Lady Sophia gave a deprecating smile. My dear Theodore, Remember that only your family is present. But it was not easy to stem the flood of Canon Spratter's eloquence. He threw back his handsome head and looked at the full-length portrait of his father in robes of office which adorned the wall. I pride myself above all things upon being abreast of the times. Every movement that savours of advance will find in me an enthusiastic supporter. My father, the late Lord Chancellor, was one of the first to perceive the coming strength of the people, and I am proud to know that my family has always identified itself with the future. Advance! Again, the thrilling voice rang out. Advance has always been our watchword. Advance and progress. Lord Spratter gave a low chuckle, for his brother was delivered into his hand. You speak as if we'd come over with the conquest, Theodore. Canon Spratter turned to him coolly. <laughs> Have you never looked out the name of Spratter in Debret? Frequently. I find the peerage excellent reading to fall back on when there's nothing in the sporting papers. But it's no blooming good, Theodore. The family tree's all bogus. A man with the name of Spratter didn't have ancestors at the Battle of Hastings. I wish to goodness you would express yourself in grammatical English, answered the canon irritably. I detest slang and I deplore this habit of yours of omitting the terminal letter of certain words. You digress, my dear Theodore. Not at all. 
I don't deny that the family has had its vicissitudes. You will find it difficult to discover one in the peerage that has not. At all events, my father implicitly believed in the family tree. Well, he must have been a pretty innocent old buffer to do that. I never found anyone else who would. Upon my word, I don't see why a man called Spratter should have ancestors called Montmorency. I should have thought that even in your brief stay at Oxford, you learnt enough natural history to know that every man must have a father, retorted the canon, ironically. Lord Spratt had been sent down from the varsity for some escapade of his early youth, and for thirty years his brother had never hesitated to remind him of it. All I can say is that if a man called Spratter had a father called Montmorency, the less said about it the better, he answered. I may be particular, but it don't sound moral to me. Your facetiousness is misplaced, Thomas, and considering that Winnie is present, the taste of it is more than doubtful. The connection at which you are pleased to sneer is perfectly clear and perfectly honourable. In 1631, Aubrey de Montmorency married, but Lady Sophia, in tones of entreaty, interrupted, Oh, Theodore, Theodore, not again! He gave her a glance of some vexation, but held his tongue. At the first millionaire I meet who's looking out for a family tree, I'll sell him mine for fifty quid, said Lord Spratt, and I'm blowed if it wouldn't be cheap at the price, considering that it's chock full of Howards and Talbots and De Veras, to say nothing of a whole string of Montmorencys. You don't know Sir John Durant the brewer, do you, father? asked Lionel. He told me that since they gave him a baronetcy, people have been regularly sending him a new and original family tree once a week. He must have quite a forest by now, answered Lord Spratter. What does he use them for, hop poles? I should have thought they would make admirable Christmas presents for his poor relations, suggested the canon, who could not resist his little joke, even on subjects dear to him. He turned again to his daughter. By the way, Winnie, I find I shall be unable to go to Mr. Railing's meeting tomorrow. He'll be awfully disappointed. He was expecting you to make a speech. I've promised Lady Vizard to lunch with her to meet the Princess of wartburg holkstein I shouldn't be able to get away early enough. A clergyman's time is really never his own, and the Princess wishes particularly to meet me. People so often forget that even royal personages have spiritual difficulties, murmured Lady Sophia. I shall write a little note to Mr. Railing, wishing him luck, and with your permission, Sophia, I'll ask him to tea afterwards. Is he presentable? He's a gentleman, Aunt Sophia, cried Winnie, and he's as beautiful as a Greek god. Winnie flushed as she said this and dropped her eyes. They were pleasant and blue like her father's, but instead of his bold friendliness, had a plaintiveness of expression which was rather charming. They seemed to appeal for confidence and for affection. Shall I come and address your meeting, Winnie? asked Lord Spratter, amused at her enthusiasm. What is it about? Teetotalism, she smiled. Most of the London clergy go in for that now, don't they? remarked Lionel. The bishop asked me the other day whether I was an abstainer. The bishop is a man of no family, Lionel, retorted his father. Personally, I make no secret of the fact that I do not approve of teetotalism. Temperance, yes. But how can you be temperate if you abstain entirely? Corn and wine, the wheat, the barley, the vine are ubiquitous. The corn strengthens, the wine gladdens man's heart, as at the marriage feast in Cana of Galilee. Lord Spratter opened his mouth to speak. I wish you wouldn't continually interrupt me, Thomas, cried the canon, before his brother could utter a word. He who has solemnly pledged himself to total abstinence has surrendered to a society of human and modern institution his liberty to choose. Now what is it you wish to say, Thomas? I merely wanted to ask Ponsonby for more potatoes. I knew it was some flippant observation, retorted the canon. The bishop suggested that total abstinence in the clergy served as an example, said Lionel mildly. As an example, it has been a dismal failure. For many years I have searched for some successful results, for one man who would prove to me that, being a drunkard, 
he was so much impressed by the example of his clergyman, who for his sake and imitation ceased to drink his glass of beer at luncheon, his glass of port at dinner, or his glass of whiskey and water at night, that he broke away from his vicious indulgence and became a sober man. Ponsonby stood at the canon's elbow, patiently waiting for the end of this harangue. Hock, sir, said he in sepulchral tones. Certainly, Ponsonby, certainly, replied the canon, so vigorously that the butler was not a little disconcerted. What do you think of this hock, Thomas? Not bad, I flatter myself. He raised the glass to his nose and inhaled the pleasant odour. He drank his wine and smiled. An expression of placid satisfaction came over his face. He favoured the company with a Latin quotation, O quam bonum est, o quam jucundum est, poculis fraternis gaudere. 2. It was one of Canon Spratter's peculiarities that he liked to read his times before any other member of his family. He found a peculiar delight in opening it himself, and likened the perusal of a newspaper which someone else had read, to the drinking of milk from which a dishonest dairyman had skimmed the cream. Next morning, running his eye down the list of contents, he discovered that the Bishop of Barchester was dead. Poor Andover is no more, Sophia, he remarked with a decent solemnity. He ate his kidney absently, and it was not till he passed his coffee cup to Lady Sophia to be refilled that he made any observation. It's really almost providential that the poor old man should depart this life on the very day I am to meet Lord Stonehenge at dinner. I'd better have the pair tonight, Sophia. Where are you dining? At the Hollingtons, he answered. Last time a bishopric was vacant, the Prime Minister practically assured me that I should have the next. He's probably done the same to half the schoolmasters in England. Nonsense! Who is there that could take it? They've none of them half the claims that I have. Theodore Spratt never concealed from the world that he rated himself highly. He esteemed bashfulness a sign of bad manners, and was used to say that a man who pretended not to know his own value was a possing fool. It's a ridiculous system altogether to give a bishopric to Tom Noddy because he's taught Latin verses to a parcel of stupid schoolboys, and besides, as the youngest son of the late Lord Chancellor, I think I may expect something from my country. Pray pass me the toast, said Lady Sophia. I'm not a vain man, but I honestly think I have the right to some recognition. As my father, the late Lord Chancellor of England, often said, I wish to goodness you wouldn't talk of him as if he were your father only, Theodore, interrupted Lady Sophia, not without irritation. I have just as much right to him as you. I think you asked for the toast, my dear. Presently, Canon Spratter, taking the paper with him, retired to his study. He was a man of regular habits, knowing that to acquire such is the first step to greatness, episcopal and otherwise, and after breakfast he was used to smoke his pipe, meditate, and read the times. But this morning, somewhat agitated by the news of Bishop Andover's demise, he took from the shelves that book which at present was his only contribution to the great literature of England. On the death of his father, laden with years and with honours, Canon Spratter had begun immediately to gather materials for a biography. This was eventually published under the title Life and Letters of Josiah Spratter, Lord Chancellor of England. It was in two volumes, magnificently bound in calf, with the family arms, a blaze of gold, on the side. When the canon set about this great work, he went to his sister and begged her to make notes of her recollections. You can help me a great deal, Sophia, he said. With your woman's intelligence, you will have noticed a good many points which have escaped me. The masculine intellect takes in the important main lines, whereas women observe only the frivolous details. But I recognize that it is just these frivolous details, properly sorted, which will give life and variety to that grand career absorbed by affairs of state and the advantage of the nation. Lady Sophia, accustomed to these tirades, smiled dryly and said, 
Shall I tell you the very first thing I remember, Theodore? I can't have been more than six years old, but I have never forgotten it. That is very interesting. Let me put it down at once. He took from his pocket the little book, which he carried with him always to jot down the thoughts that periodically occurred to him. Now, Sophia. Father and mother were having a conversation, and suddenly father beat his fist on the table so that the whole room shook. Yes, he had that energetic, effective way of expressing himself, said the canon. He was a man of really forceful character. That is a point upon which I mean to lay great stress. He beat his fist on the table, and he roared out at the top of his voice, Your father's a damned fool, Maria, and your mother's a damned fool, Maria, but by gad, you're a bigger damned fool than both of them put together. The canon sprang up, and throwing back his head with a gesture habitual to him, drew to his full, imposing height. You shock and surprise me, Sophia. If these are your recollections, I advise you to forget them as quickly as you possibly can. Nor had he better success with his brother. I wonder whether you can give me no anecdotes, no interesting sidelights on our father's character. I am determined to make my biography as complete as possible. I'll give you an anecdote by all means, said Lord Spratter. You remember that the olden very much objected to potatoes baked in their skins. A very pardonable and interesting idiosyncrasy of genius, interposed the biographer. Well, one Sunday night when we had people to supper, by some accident they were brought in. The servant handed the dish to father. Father looked at him and slowly rose to his feet. Don't you know, you idiot, he bellowed, that I don't like potatoes baked in their skins? He took them out of the dish, one by one, while the servant stood petrified, and threw them with all his might at the pictures on the walls. Each picture had its potato till the dish was empty. Then he sat down again calmly, and began to eat his supper. I shall certainly put down nothing in my biography which tends to cast ridicule or odium on the memory of a great man, said Canon Spratter, frigidly. My motto is, De mortui nil nisi bonum. On this principle, the life and letters was written. To testify to filial admiration, there were in St. Gregory's Vicarage no less than three portraits of the first Earl Spratter, but the most characteristic was a copy of that which the Chancellor himself, with due regard to his fame and importance, had bequeathed to the National Portrait Gallery. It showed the great man seated, his hands grasping the arms of his chair with the savage vigour that was customary with him. They were strong, large hands, and the tendons stood out from the brutal force wherewith he held them. He looked the spectator full in the face, sitting very squarely, bent forward in the despotic attitude which all who had appeared before him knew so well. He wore the full-bottomed wig of his office and the gorgeous robes, edged with gold. His head was thrust out, and he stared from under his shaggy brows with an expression of ruthless violence. His strong features were set in a villainous scowl. His hard, cruel mouth was clenched as though he were determined that nothing should affect his will. And the idea which the fine portrait gave was borne out by the memoirs of the time. Springing, notwithstanding the canon's grandiloquence, from the dregs of commercial life, Josiah Spratter had fought his way to the greatest prize of his calling by an indomitable will and a truculent savagery that spared neither enemies nor friends. Though endowed by nature with no great subtlety of mind, he had a gift of fluent speech, an imperturbable self-confidence, and a physique of extraordinary vigour. He was unhampered by any thought for the susceptibilities of others, and he was regardless of good manners. He bullied his way to the woolsack by the weight of his personality and the harsh roar of his voice. From the outset of his career as a junior, he treated his leaders with unhidden contempt. He used the solicitors who gave him briefs like vermin, dealing with them as might a harsh master with a set of ignorant and rebellious schoolboys. They hated him, 
but were impressed with all, and quickly brought him more work than he could do. Then, beginning to feel his power, he browbeat the court so that weak judges were like wax in his hands, and juries trembled at his ferocious glance. He went into Parliament and trampled impartially upon his associates and his opponents. He excited more hatred than any one of his generation, for he was insolent, overbearing, and impatient of contradiction. But in a short while, the government was forced to make him Attorney General. From the beginning, his mind had been set on the ultimate goal, and he waited till the Chancellor of that time died. This was the most critical point of his life, for all concerned understood perfectly at what Josiah Spratter aimed. But now, all the bitterness, anger, and loathing he had so willfully aroused were banded against him, and he had to fight as well against the rivalry of some and the bitterness of others. But like a lion at bay, with magnificent self-confidence, he squared himself to bear down all obstacles. The government was undecided. A certain eminent lawyer, Sir Robert Parkley, had claims upon it which were undeniable. Having held office in a previous administration, he had waived his right to promotion on the understanding that his reward should be great thereafter. He was a man of vigorous understanding, learned, urbane, and of great family. The appointment would be very popular, but the Attorney General was not a man to be trifled with, and a go-between was sent unofficially to learn his views. I suppose Parkley will get the Chancellorship, said this person, in the course of an amiable conversation. You suppose nothing of the sort, shouted Josiah Spratter. His face grew red with passion, and his scowl deepened as the veins of his forehead stood out like knotted cords. He fixed on the man those piercing eyes which seemed to read into the soul, discovering shameful secrets. You've been sent to find out what I thought about the Chancellorship? It's what I suspected. Don't deny it. Beads of sweat stood on the other's brow as the Attorney General towered over him, threatening and peremptory. He vowed he had received no such mission. Don't deny it, I tell you, cried Josiah Spratter. Then, furiously, he walked up and down the room. Tell them, he hissed at length with undescribable venom, tell them that if Parkley is made Chancellor, I'll kick the government out. By God, they shan't stay in a month. While the appointment was pending, a great lady, suffering under some brutal affront, sought to beard the lion. Do you know what people are saying about you, Mr. Attorney? They're wondering who this sprat is that we are asked to swallow. Sir Josiah looked at her. Tell your friends, madam, to be thankful the sprat is not a whale, because even if he were, by God they'd have to swallow him. And what's more, they'd have to pretend they liked him. Shortly afterwards, the Prime Minister wrote a very civil note to his subordinate offering him the much-coveted place. Josiah Spratter was raised to the peerage. A second term of office was rewarded by new honour, and he became Earl Spratt of Beechcombe and Viscount Rallington. But the great lawyer carried also into private life the tones with which he cowed juries and sent witnesses fainting from the box. He never spoke but to command and gave no order without a string of oaths. When he fell into a temper, which happened several times a day, he could be heard from top to bottom of the house. His wife, his servants, trembled before him. His children in his presence spoke in whispers, and he took pleasure in humiliating them with brutal raillery. He met his match but twice. The first time was at his club when he was playing whist. This was his favourite relaxation, and he was always to be found in the card room about six o'clock, waiting for a rubber. One day by chance a fourth could not be found, and the Chancellor himself went into the smoking room to look for a player. It was a sunny afternoon in July, and the place was deserted, except for a young guardsman who sat comfortably sleeping in an armchair. Without hesitation, Lord Spratter shook him violently till he was wide awake and asked if he knew the game. 
He answered that he played very badly and would much sooner resume his nap. But Lord Spratter declined to hear excuses and dragged him by sheer force into the card room. The soldier had only spoken the truth when he described himself as a bad player, and since he was the Chancellor's partner, things did not go very smoothly. The elder man took no trouble to hide his annoyance when the other made a mistake and expressed his opinion of the subaltern's intelligence with more bluntness than civility. "'Oh, confound you! Shut up!' cried the guardsman at last. "'How do you expect a fellow to play if you go on ragging him like a fishwife?' "'I don't think you know who I am, sir,' answered the Chancellor with frowning brows. "'Oh, yes, I do. You're the Lord Chancellor, aren't you? But you might mind your manners for all that. You're not in your dirty police court now.' For the rest of that rubber, the distinguished lawyer never opened his mouth. But next time he was worsted in debate, the results were more serious. Lord Spratt, still restless after the attainment of his ambition, was seized with the desire to found a great family, and on this account wished his eldest son, who had assumed the title of Viscount Rallington, to marry a certain heiress of important connections. The lady was not unwilling, but Rallington stubbornly refused. At first, white with rage, Lord Spratter asked how he dared to cross him, and he showered upon his son that abundant vituperation of which he was the finest master in England, but without effect. The Chancellor was so astounded at this display of spirit that for once in his life he condescended to argue. His son stood firm. Then the old man burst out again with violent temper. And who the devil are you? he cried. Haven't I raised you from the gutter? What would you be without me? By God, you shall do whatever I tell you. Rallington lost all patience. He put off the timidity with which for years he had endured so much and went up to his father. Look here, don't talk to me like that. I'll marry a barmaid if I choose and be damned to you. The Chancellor's hair stood on end with wrath, and he gasped for breath. His passion was such that for a minute he couldn't speak. Then his son, driven at length to open rebellion, poured out the hatred which had so long accumulated. He reminded him of the tyranny with which he had used his whole family and the terror in which he had held them. He had robbed them of all freedom so that they were slaves to his every whim. To his angry violence and to his selfishness, all their happiness had been sacrificed. You've been a bullying ruffian all your life, and no one has had the pluck to stand up to you. I'm sick of it, and I won't stand it any more. Do you hear? At last the Chancellor found words and beset his son with a torrent of blasphemy and with foul-mouthed abuse. Be quiet, said the other, standing up to him. How dare you speak to me like that? It's no good trying to bully me now. By God, I'll knock you down. Rallington thrust his face close to his father's, and for a moment fear seized the old man. Here at length was someone whom he could not cow, and he hated his son. You'd better not touch me. You can't thrash me now as you could when I was a boy. I recommend you to take great care. Lord Spratter raised his hands, but a trembling came suddenly upon him, so that he could not move. Get out of my house, he screamed. Get out of my house. I'm only too glad to go. The arteries beat in the old man's head so that he thought some horrible thing would happen to him. He poured out brandy and drank it, but it tasted like water. He sat for hours with clenched fists and scowling brow. And at last, with a savage laugh, he took his will and with his own hand wrote a codicil in which he deprived his elder son of every penny he could. This relieved him, and he breathed more freely. Presently he called his family together and told them, without a word of explanation, that Rallington was his son no longer. If any of you mention his name, or if I hear that you have had any communication with him, you shall go as he went. 
the pair never met again, for Rallington went abroad and died, unmarried, one month before his father. Thomas, the next son, who had been known all his life as Tommy Tiddler, succeeded the Chancellor as second Earl Spratt of Beachcombe. But the excellent Theodore, with proper devotion, took care in his biography not even to hint at this characteristic violence. He wrote with a flowing, somewhat pompous style, and the moral pointed by these two handsome volumes was that with uprightness, sobriety, and due allegiance to the Church by law established, it was possible to reach the highest honours. The learned canon traced the ancestry of his family to very remote periods. He had no difficulty in convincing himself that the plebeian surname was but a vulgar error for de Pra, and to the outspoken ridicule of his elder brother was able after much study to announce that a member of the English branch of the Montmorency had assumed the name in the 17th century upon his marriage with a French heiress. With these distinguished antecedents, it was no wonder that Josiah Spratter should appear a benevolent old gentleman of mild temper and pious disposition, apt to express himself in well-balanced periods. He would have made an excellent churchwarden or a secretary to charitable institutions, but why precisely he should have become Lord Chancellor of England nowhere appeared. In short, the eloquent divine, with the best intentions in the world, wrote a life of his father, which was not only perfectly untrue, but also exceedingly tedious. The book had a certain success with old ladies, who put it beside their works of devotion and had it read to them in hours of mental distress. Sometimes, when they were persons of uncommon importance, the canon himself consented to read to them, and then, so spirited was his delivery, so well modulated his voice, it seemed as improving as one of his own sermons. But the life and letters certainly had no more assiduous nor enthusiastic reader than the author thereof. I don't think I'm a vain man, he remarked, but I can't help feeling this is exactly how a biography ought to be written. There was a knock at the door, and the canon, replacing the volume at which he had glanced, took out in its stead the first book of Hooker's Ecclesiastical Polity. He had far too keen a sense of decorum to appear one man to the world and to his immediate relatives another. No unforeseen accident had ever found him other than self-contained, oratorical, and didactic. Not even his family was privileged to see him en robe de chambre. It was his son who knocked. Lionel had been taking an early service at St. Gregory's and had not yet seen his father. "'Come in, come in,' said the canon. "'Good morning, Lionel.' "'I hope I'm not disturbing you, father. I want to book some certificates.' "'You can never disturb me when you are fulfilling the duties of your office, my boy. Pray sit down.' He put the ecclesiastical polity open on the desk. "'Hello, are you reading this?' asked the curate. "'I've not looked at it since I was at Oxford.' then you make a mistake, Lionel. Hooker's ecclesiastical polity is not only a monument of the English church, but also a masterwork of the English language. That is my complaint with the clergy of the present day, that they neglect the great productions of their fathers. Stevenson you read, and you read Renan, atheist though he is. But Hooker you have not looked at since you were at Oxford. I see that Andover is dead, father, said Lionel, to change the conversation. I look upon it as an uncommon happy release. I wonder if they really will offer you the bishopric. My dear boy, that is not a subject upon which I allow my thoughts to dwell. I will not conceal from you that, as the youngest surviving son of the late Lord Chancellor, I think I have some claims upon my country, and I have duties towards it as well, so that if the bishopric is offered to me, I shall not hesitate to accept. You remember St. Paul's words to Timothy? This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. But in these matters there is so much ignoble wire-pulling, so much backstairs influence to which my character is not suited and to which I could not bring myself to descend. 
Presently, however, when Canon Spratter strolled along Piccadilly on the way to his club, it occurred to him that the day before he had given his tailor an order for two pairs of trousers. His circumstances had taught him neither to spend money recklessly nor to despise a certain well-bred economy, and it was by no means impossible that he would have no use for those particular articles of clothing. He walked up Savile Row. Mr. Marsden, will you inquire whether those garments I ordered yesterday have been cut yet? The tailor passed the question down his speaking tube. No, sir, he said. Not yet. Then will you delay them till further notice? Certainly, sir. Canon Spratter was going out of the shop when he noticed on a fashion plate the costume of a bishop. Ah, do you make gaiters, Mr. Marsden? said he, stopping. Yes, sir. They're very difficult things to cut. So many of my friends wear very ill-fitting gaiters. Fine day, isn't it? Good morning.